Hello and welcome to Common Ground Storytelling. My name is Cheryl Peralt and this program is Common Ground Storytelling. Um, I used to host true storytelling programs in local cafes and art centers. This is the third program um, that we have been hosting on Zoom and live stream through HCAM TV to accommodate to the times of uh, pandemic and quarantine. Um, and I have to say that I am liking it um, and that we are able to invite people to join us from the local area where we are in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, to as well as uh, invite people across the country and around the world as well. And um, that goes for tonight. We have it. one of our guests is coming in from Kenya, which is special in Hopkinton because in April, most every year we have uh, guests from Kenya come just before the Boston Marathon and visit the children in the schools. Uh, the elite run runners come and uh, they have a special program usually with the elementary school and some of the runners run with the high school students. It's very special and we, we miss that and we miss the Boston Marathon this month as well. And um, it's the second time we are missing it, but we do have a guest from Kenya. And so that's pretty exciting. And just like with the marathon, our town opens its arms once a year to the whole world, which is a very exciting concept for a community. And I like to think similarly, whether we are local from this side of town or the other side of the country or the world that we're also all connected as a world family in listening and sharing our stories, which offers the opportunity to discover our common ground not only as a means of art and entertainment with storytelling, but also to promote a deeper sense of understanding and felt connection with one another. So we're here to share stories tonight on the theme, Earth Day is Every Day, which uh, is a favorite theme for me because in April, it is also Earth Day on April 22nd. Uh, but this theme is intended to address the importance of feeling our deep connection to the earth every day, all the time. And tonight I'm joined by nine of our 10 community storytellers, and they are all friends from different places that I know of who uh, work closely with the earth outdoors, or uh, I have been witness to how close a connection they have with the earth in their daily life. And so I asked each of them to think of a story and share it for five minutes or less and to record it. And that's the idea of this program. We are about to see pre-recorded stories from all the folks here. Um, and we will also get to know um, each of the storytellers except Veer from Kenya, because I believe it's about 2, 2 a.m. there right now. So um, you'll get to hear a little bit from each of the guest storytellers. And as viewers on YouTube, there is also the opportunity for you this evening to make a comment in the comment section as you're hearing these stories come out. Not so much to give your feedback because these stories are in no judgment zone uh, overall, but more so how do different stories connect with you? Perhaps there's a phrase or a little sentence you can type in when something resonates. It's a similar story for you, maybe a different circumstance um, so that we get some information that we can weave in from our live audience this evening as well, which makes it feel almost like being at the cafe in a way. So you are welcome to check out the comment section. Now, although most of the people here don't know each other, I realized that 
um, looking at the common ground of what I know about them, their bios, the information I got from them, their stories, there are a lot of interesting interconnection that you might discover. Um, and I'll just, I wrote this little play of connection before we get started to uh, kind of give an introduction to you there. And I'm going to say it quickly uh, to move us on. So if you don't quite get it, you can replay it later on when we are posted on YouTube. There's someone who built a yurt recently and there's someone else who lived in a yurt in the 1970s for a few years in the woods with her spouse and baby. There's someone who became involved in archaeoastrology by noticing the sun in her backyard and someone else who goes out every morning to give sunrise, sunrise gratitude. There's someone who works in a hospital for healing people at the end of life and someone else who works with children as a doctor in Vermont. There's someone who was in Vermont once and needed medical treatment who studies herbal medicine and someone who works with plants as a landscaper who found her job thanks to her love of nature as a child. There's someone here who's a young person and a true force of connection for people and nature whose grandmother used to sit in the parlor of Wangari Mathai in Kenya. And there's someone here on the other side of the world so inspired by the reforestation of Kenya with the millions of trees named Wangari Mathai who was the uh, activist who achieved this she wrote a song for her. There's someone who loves to walk around Hopkinton, Massachusetts with her husband and has granted, um, identified themselves as honorary recipients of an award for a couple exploring every possible trail and path in this town. And there's another person who also loves the local trails and walking, whether it's near the glaciers or it's in India where uh, she sees the world as magical, even wit when witnessing monkeys who once stole a wallet of a fellow tourist, tossing it over the cliff and perhaps reprioritizing people to focus on what's most precious, to feel the deep awe and reverence of life every moment if we're willing to make time and listen. That's a little aside I got from that person's family member. So. After um, seeing these stories and knowing and talking with these storytellers, I feel like we are family. And I feel like I've gone on many different trips and locations nearby as well as around the world and learned a great deal about the earth. So now I'd like to begin and invite you to settle back and listen to these wonderful people who have shared their time and their stories to tell us how Earth Day is every day. I would like to begin this evening with Jihang Padma. So I will just say welcome to Jihang. Uh, hello. Hi there. And I will just tell viewers a little bit about you. It's good to see you. You are in San Francisco, California today, okay. so thank you for joining. Um, and just to let people know that uh, Jihang used to live in Metro West Boston for 25 years, and now she lives and works in San Francisco, working at UCSF Medical Center as a chaplain resident. And Jihang also is a Zen teacher and has taught meditation at uh, different centers, including Omega in the summers, and um, as well as Wellesley College, where I met her years ago. And Ji Hong has published two books, um, and her latest one just released is titled Field of Blessings, Ritual and Consciousness in the World of Buddhist Healers. And that is the title, and I know you are busy. You're in the middle of work. Um, as well as a book tour, currently a virtual book tour for your book. And for the uh, few minutes we have, I wonder if you can tell how that's going, how the book tour is, how your book is, how it connects with the theme, whatever you'd like to say um, for about two minutes. Well, there's a, there's a natural affinity um, between the, uh, the nature and a highly realized person. From the very beginning of Buddhism, um, you know, Buddha, um, was born under a tree. He got enlightenment under a tree and he died under a tree. 
And so we hold the trees in very high regard. And um, so this story is about how I go out into nature to, uh, to recenter and strengthen my own practice and the amazing gifts of the universe that surprise and delight me there. Well, that, um, I know it's wonderful because I've already seen it. Um, and uh, just wondering how the book tour is going for you. Um, it's beautiful. It's been a gift of the universe, the, very well received. I've sold out all of the books I had on hand and I'm having to order more, which is a, a blessing. Um, and it's really uh, sparked networking uh, conversations uh, that people are being brought into uh, across the country that I couldn't have imagined. Oh, that's wonderful. Congratulations. And um, so if people want to tune into your book or your book tours, uh, is there a, a keyword? Uh, mountainpath.org is the website. Um, mountainpath.org uh, slash books for the exact book details, uh, mm -hmm. book and, and all. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and best wishes with your book and your work. And this weekend, hopefully you'll get a little time outside, which I know you love. So okay. let's take a look at your uh, story now, Jihong. Thank you again. Thank you. Every day is Earth Day. Even as a child, I would go out at dawn to see the sunrise as I meditated. I knew I could find clarity in nature. Zen master Sun Sanim often told us, if you have a question, ask a tree. The tree will give you a good answer. Many of his students have gone out in the wild, fasting the body and mind through retreat, so as to reconnect with our natural wisdom as we discover it reflected back by the teachings of mountains and rivers. The solo retreat is a rite of passage for me and many others throughout history. My most beloved place for these retreats is Temenos in Shutesbury. Its forest and mineral springs reconnected me to a place outside of time, a source of energy and infinite peace. The dirt road was closed in snow season, which gave the pilgrim a healthy half mile hike uphill with backpack. Yet so worthwhile to hear coyotes at night, to see infinite stars over a dark forest, to practice in silence among the cedars, to put everything down, which seems to weigh so heavily and discover how light it is simply to live. To sleep well, remember dreams and rise early, the cabin lit by gleaming embers. A few days at Temenos helped me create space for all transitions, the turnings of seasons, and also my own new beginnings. Here are a few snapshots from Temenos World. Clear pebbles of hail fall among spotted Fs and rust brown needles. Fs are amphibians like newts. My sister calls them baby dinosaurs. Walking from the knoll to the lookout, one frog sighted, a single white stripe adorning its lithe body. One tiny tree frog 24 red spotted Fs this morning, especially the red spotted Fs. On solo retreats, as I fasted and released whatever needed to go, these elemental creatures accompanied me. To see one spotted F is already epiphany, but 24 Fs among the lichen, the leaves, the stones, the grass. Their vivid colors shift my perceptual focus, and I see now the world through the scale of an eft, each inch of it sacred. Here are a few more images, a frog at dusk, flutter of hawk's wing, 
The sound of the pine grove's height. Spirals of labyrinth. Rock etched with the pulse of time. Clatter of porcupine upon bark. Deer tracks. Early light floods the valley. Hummingbird, whir of radiance, welcoming me home. Thank you. Thank you, Ji Hong, very much. Um, I appreciate your story. I always appreciate uh, what you have to share about nature with me as well, even though we're on the opposite sides of the country now. And I also appreciate your blogs, posts, um, in looking up your name as well when you're showing photographs and writing. So thank you thank and you. have a good weekend in California. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Laura Harrigan. Hi, Laura. Hi, Cheryl. Good to see you on the other side of town <laughs> <laughs> on Zoom. And uh, thank you for being with us this evening. I want to tell people a little bit about you and then we can have a few minutes to talk as well before we see your story, which I really appreciated. You're making time to record. Uh, Laura Harrigan is, has been a Hopkinton resident for 10 years and she has two daughters in high school. Laura is a landscape designer and does work in client care for residential landscape maintenance and design build for design build company. Laura is an avid runner, but she prefers quiet solo runs rather than races. And Laura has been on trips to Africa that taught her new perspective on plants. And she adds that her current obsession is moss art. Um, so I have a lot of questions that I know we only have a little time. I'm curious, what is moss art? And I'm also curious what you learned from plants in Africa when you were there. I don't know, whatever you want to address, take your pick. Sure. Um, I, what well, I'll start with the current obsession, moss art. Uh, this came about because as part of my job, we are designing a new studio. We just purchased, leased a new studio space and we wanted to install a moss art wall. We thought that would be very appropriate given the industry that we're in. Um, but when we got the price to have it installed, we did not have anywhere near the budget to have that done. So then I thought, well, wait a minute, maybe we can build it. So I looked into some DIY YouTubing videos um, and learned that I absolutely can build it. So I now have a dining room full of moss, which by the way, who does not love moss? I have a little bit of a moss obsession when I go for hikes out in the woods. Um, so I have a dining room full of moss, full of bark with lichen, like um, Ji Hong mentions, lichen in her piece. Um, and the lichen is beautiful, mint green to chartreuse. Um, and we're going to put little bits of lichen covered bark in with the moss pieces. Um, the, the, we're creating a big piece. It's going to be gigantic. Yeah, nine, 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 six, wow. um, so I've also been practicing creating little pieces. So anyway, that's my, that's my moss art. Obsession. Well, I, I want to come over for uh, dinner uh, inside, outside one of these days <laughs> yeah. when I can. Um, and how about the uh, second question then? Yeah, um, yeah. So what I was so curious when we went to Africa um, to learn about their plants, um, and you know, I'd see these beautiful flowering trees, and I would ask whoever I was around, "What is what is that plant?" Because uh, I don't know this you know, the plant vernacular over there at all. So I would ask people and they would just kind of look at me and be very quizzical. Like, why would you care? It's just a flower. I'm like, just a flower. Like it's spectacular. And mm -hmm. literally one person after another, I would ask that to you until one person finally said to me, well, I don't know what that is. It's just a flower, but next to it is a cashew. And over there is a mango and over there is a papaya. And I thought, wait a minute. So the plants that people care about 
in other parts of the world are not necessarily the ones that are beautiful, which is what we value, right, in America. What they care about are the productive plants, the things that are either fruiting or medicinal or support textiles because they dye the plants, um, they use the dyes to dye material. Those plants, everyone knows from adults to young, young, young little children. Um, and the flowering plants are just sort of backdrop. They don't care about them. They don't notice them. They don't have the value, um, which was just really, it was really interesting. Um, the context, the difference in values, that culture versus here. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, and where were you uh, traveling? We were in the Gam we were in the Gambia. Um, it was my family. Uh, we were on a service trip to an all girls school over there. So we spent okay. a couple of weeks with the girls. Well, uh, thank you. And I would imagine with your work that uh, that would be a priority for you to identify the, the beauty of flowers. Mm -hmm. So we have a story uh, from you that takes us from childhood to current day. So uh, let's take a look and see what Laura has to offer from her, the story from her life. Hi, I'm Laura Harrigan, uh, and in honor of Earth Day is Every Day, Cheryl asked me to share some stories about my love of nature. Uh, my very first memory of nature, fascination, fascination with nature, uh, was when I was in preschool. My mom came to pick me up one day, and there was this little pond uh, right outside the preschool. And as we were walking to the car, I noticed there were all these tiny little frogs um, jumping into the pond. Um, and I have no idea where they were coming from. There were literally thousands of them. Um, and I was just like, oh my gosh, I was so taken with these little frogs. Um, so my mom and I spent probably an hour uh, walking around the pond edge, collecting these tiny little frogs um, and bringing them home. And then I spent the rest of the afternoon just playing with my little frog babies. Um, Eventually, I think they all hopped off into the woods. Hopefully, they found another little pond to live in. Um, but then that sort of fascination with those frogs as I grew older turned into um, just a love of trying to find frogs and salamanders and toads in the woods. Uh, so I would go out in our backyard um, and I'd turn over rocks and um, logs and I would collect all the little critters that I would find and I'd bring them back to the house and make little habitats for them, um, you know, with moss and stones and sticks and I'd give them water. And I just loved creating those little habitats. Uh, and my mom was great about letting me do that and keep them, keep them in the garage, not in the house. Um, and it's funny today, one of my favorite things as an adult, one of my favorite places in nature is on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we go there every summer as a family and our all time favorite spot is Norton Point, which is a sandbar. And on one side, it's the open ocean. Um, the other side is the bay and the bay side is, as you would imagine, very calm and quiet and peaceful. Um, and one of our first trips there, we had noticed another family had a little kiddie pool. And um, in the kiddie pool, they had co been collecting stuff from the water, sh snails and crabs and um, hermit crabs and fish and stuff. And it was just their little aquarium um, on Oceanside. And I thought that was the coolest thing. So um, we left the beach that day and I went straight to the store, bought our own little plastic kiddie pool and nets for the kids. And next day we went back to the same spot and we started our own little aquarium. Um, and uh, so we would catch all sorts of stuff. We caught all different crabs, blue crabs, hermit crabs, spider crabs, horseshoe crabs, very, very cool, um, and snails. And one day, um, and, and we would make little habitats for them too, like I used to do when I was little, but this time it was with sand and with seaweed and shells and create little spaces and little separate habitats for all the different creatures that we had caught. Um, and one day there was this hermit crab that was huge, way too big for its shell. It was like Popeye, like huge upper body and then teeny tiny little lower body stuffed into this tiny little shell. And I thought, that guy, that shell is not the right shell for that hermit crab. And it made me wonder, how do they 
change shells because obviously the shells don't grow with them. And it had never occurred to me that these are creatures that habitat old discarded shells. And so I said to the kids, hey, let's see if we can find a bigger shell um, that this little guy can maybe move into and see if he moves into it. So we collected a whole bunch of different shells that were a size up from the one he was living in. And um, we kind of let him do his thing and watched him for a little bit. And then we went off and um, came back to it a little while later. And I noticed that he was sort of playing with one of the bigger shells. He had like grabbed onto it and he was turning it around and poking at it. Um, and all of a sudden he grabbed the edge of the shell, pulled himself out of his no old shell, turned himself around and backed himself into the new, the new bigger shell, which I thought that was the coolest thing I had ever seen, that I had just watched this crab grow into a new shell. Um, silly, but uh, the things, I don't know, that you, that you get fascinated with. So uh, those are some of my stories. And I'm very lucky now that my job is, uh, I work as a residential landscape designer uh, for a landscape maintenance company. Um, so I get to spend pretty much every day talking about horticulture and walking around beautiful gardens. Um, and uh, it all started with my little fascination with those little tiny frogs way back in preschool. Thank you, Laura. I uh, have uh, seashell envy um, in seeing that moment uh, where you saw the uh, the taking on of a new home uh, with the tide pool you had created and uh, appreciate your sharing these moments of nature and how they inspired you in your interest now uh, in interacting with the natural world. So thank you very much. I noticed one comment um, earlier, I think it was from Neil Braverman. So hello, Neil. And I know I um, am intending to put out some questions to prompt a little uh, for audience to chat. So one of them, okay, how about if we combine the past two uh, stories and the storytellers, um, for instance, has anyone ever had a memorable moment with a frog or peeper? Uh, or how about witnessing a baby dinosaur, as Jihan had mentioned? Something to think about, maybe to uh, put in the comment or something else that uh, resonated uh, with your life and experiences and the stories you heard. We would like to hear from you uh, as viewers and weave them into our program too. So you're welcome to give some comments and we'll see what we uh, have in common. Next, we are moving on to Kathy Weaver Taylor. So hello, Kathy. I know I saw you earlier. Hi there. Hi, Kathy. Good to see you. Um, I will tell you a little about Kathy now. Kathy is um, down the street a bit in the next town of Upton. Kathy, I know uh, as an artist, a writer of poems and a gardener. And she became interested in archaeoastronomy back in college, her college days. She has lived in Upton for over 30 years and became interested in the Upton Chamber and the book Manitou and the cultural history of the area of which she lives. Kathy has also supported federally recognized tribes in the identification and protection of ceremonial stone sites in various places in the Northeast. And she is presently working on researching and mapping stone sites in Nipmuc Upton area. So uh, welcome, and I appreciate that you made time to share a story about Earth Day being every day. And since I know you as an artist, as well as more recently learning from you about stone sites in our areas, I wonder how you think art helps us connect with nature. Well, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> 
how does art help us connect with nature? Well, I always feel like nature is the, um, the ultimate artist. And as, as people, we are um, really insignificant <laughs> in comparison. Um, so particularly this time of year with the spring, you know, the winter is so black and white. And then all of a sudden in the springtime, all the colors come out. So I've been greeting every color. You know, we've, I've got daffodils and then some blue flowers and that green grass just uh, turned green the other day. And um, colors in particular after a long winter, I think nature is the ultimate artist, I'd have yeah. to say. Mm -hmm. Colors in the sunlight. Yeah, and um, the other question I had, or you can take it as you wish, uh, it can be an open question, but I know one of the things I know, one of the stories about you is how uh, this looking at the sun in your backyard one morning changed your life, kind of, well, whatever you want to say. It is true that um, <clears throat> I, I'm a, uh, I was a middle school teacher for a very, very long time, and you're up at the crack of dawn. And when I moved to Upton, my kitchen window looked out to the east and every morning I would get to see, see the sunrise and I did notice that it moved. It, it went south in the winter and went up to the north in the summer and it went back and forth and back and forth. And that was really, I think the beginning of me really looking at um, the fact that we're in a, a, a that the earth is within a, a greater um, universe and that we're interacting with this with the sun and the solar system and that we have the moon and all the stars rising and I did get really um, very involved with it and and all of this has a lot to do with different sites so that I um, I um, I wish we could see more my my biggest wish is we could go back and see the Milky Way every night. You know, that we would see more stars, mm -hmm. that we would have our lights, but you can get lights that don't um, block out the sky so much. And I think everybody would be in better shape if we could see the Milky Way galaxy that we're a part of every night, like people have for thousands of years until all the electricity came in, which is wonderful in some ways, but missing out on the, on the sky um, is something also. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's a pretty comprehensive answer for a couple of minutes. And now let's um, take a look at the story that you have to share. Thank you, Kathy. I'm Kathy Taylor. I want to tell you a story about the Nipmucks. I moved to Upton about 30 years ago and um, I first heard about the Nipmucks. My, the high school in Upton is called Nipmuck High School. And I found out that the Nipmucks were called the freshwater fishermen. And I always wondered about this freshwater fisherman. I'm thinking, what did they do? Did they catch trout? Did they catch bass? I mean, what, what is all this fish they were catching? So come to find out that I've, um, with, the, with a lot of research, I found out that early in May, um, before all the Europeans got here, people for thousands and thousands of years, <clears throat> they had a really strong connection to these ocean fish that would leave the ocean and come up the rivers, up the waterfalls, up to the quiet streams. And these big mama, like pickerel and alewife, sometimes salmon, they come up to these quiet, quiet places that were high up where the springs were. <clears throat> and these big mama fish would lay all their eggs and then the male fish would come and fertilize them. And um, these fish would be, um, the Indians always made sure that the food source was replenished so that um, they would catch a lot of fish on their way up to um, laying their eggs, but they would make sure that enough eggs were laid so that the cycle would continue. So I found out in early May, all the Indians would gather at the waterfalls and have these big celebrations. So after a long winter and they would catch all these fish and they would have big feasts and big gatherings and um, they would dry a lot of the fish to have a food source to get through all the planting that was coming up next. And <clears throat> I've, been, um, I've been thinking that a lot of their ceremonies and, and you know, things that were happening were probably singing and calling to the fish, um, reminding them that it was kind of time to come home, time to, um, kind of, time to come back. And um, so 
so then so then the other thing that I found out was in the fall, a whole nother series of um, things with fish happen. And that is the freshwater fish, the eel, this kind of long snake-like fish would leave the fresh waters and in this freshwater fish, the eel, they go down to the salt water to lay their eggs. So that they leave in great numbers in the fall and that the fish weirs would catch all the eels in the, in the winter time, before the winter and they would dry them and use the, the uh, nutrient dense eel meat to get through the winter. So the eels go to the Caribbean and they lay their eggs there in the salt water. And these little translucent kind of egg uh, beings kind of float to the coast. And the eels are very transformative. They have, um, they turn into a little snaky kind of thing. And at some point they have these little legs that they can crawl up on the mud. And then they become that long snake-like uh, fish again, and they finally get back up to the, um, the, you know, the quiet fresh waters where they live as long lives as they can. So the, <clears throat> so the nipmucks, um, this freshwater fish, between the ocean fish coming up to um, Swan and the eels going down to the Caribbean, they really lived off these these two um, these these two fish beings, and I am reminded that um, with all our infinite wisdom of um, computers and electric lights and our and our life that we have right now, the ancient um, ability to to blend in to be harmonious with the landscape. They had um, fish, ocean fish coming up to them very easily to be caught. And there's something to be said for um, ancient um, ecological knowledge that I feel like we really need to get back to. Thank you, Kathy. Um, really uh, important conclusion to your story and Thank you for sharing all of the research that you have been doing and melding it together uh, when you're offering it out to community along with what you learn about sky and fish and, and people uh, cultures of singing to fish and, and the art of the earth as well. And I have, um, in weaving in some of the audience, I have seen some comments coming up uh, about people uh, having interactions with crabs. And uh, I think uh, Fs or little uh, salamander creatures. Um, however, I cannot remember the uh, precise uh, quotes, references, uh, what people are saying, but it looks like there are people saying that they have had good moments with such creatures as well. So after hearing Kathy's story, I also wonder if you have a fish story, uh, which can go, I believe, in a lot of directions. Um, and uh, so I, Kathy, from uh, talking to you about your story, I will remember your reference to the idea of singing to the fish and really getting everything you need back in time uh, with the Nipmuc people having the fish come right to them that way is really a beautiful and important reminder for us how the earth can take care of us and give us everything we need. So thank you. And next I would like to invite Frank Albani. Hello, Frank. Hi, Cheryl. Oh, there you are. Good to see you. And you are coming in from Plymouth. Yep, home in Plymouth. Home in Plymouth, very good. And thank you for being part of this program tonight and sharing your story. And I will tell people about you um, a little bit, including that Frank is 67 years young, is what he offered in his bio. And Frank grew up in Millis, Massachusetts, and he's lived in Plymouth for most of the last 50 years. Frank is an accomplished carpenter, and he just retired from 24 years of organic vegetable farming. 
Frank also loves playing guitar with his band Plymouth Rock Music and with his many other musical friends. And he has a deep love of nature and loves fishing from his rowboat off Manamet Beach. So you might have some fish stories also. Uh, and um, you, you can learn more about Frank and his music. Uh, he has a CD released in 2017 titled Songs for My Mother, correct? That's right. And I, you were asking me about it, so I, I have a copy. Oh, right here. great. Yes. And this is, uh, you, were, you were wondering about the uh, cover. It, my artist friend Rick Murphy uh, did a painting of the earth, and uh, you can make, make out a nipple right over Plymouth there. And, ah, uh, yes. You know, trying to signify Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, being an organic farmer, of course, you're, you're, you've hopefully got your hands in the soil, you know, every day and uh, making that physical connection that I, I truly believe is uh, important. And our society today has gotten so far away from that, uh, it could only do us good for people to get out and dig in the dirt, uh, you know, and make that physical connection to open up other spiritual channels. Um, yeah, I could tell you a few fish stories, <laughs> but uh, you know I want to keep it brief. But I do love I love where I live near the beach, and I love being out in my boat uh, on the water, fishing, and just looking around, experiencing the beauty. Uh, you know, as well as being at the farm, and uh, uh, New England is an amazing place with the different seasons and the a beautiful change in colors and. Uh, we That's right. Should... You're gardening now, right? You're yeah, I, I have. Now. I have some things going in the greenhouse now. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm lucky in that way. I still uh, have a, a large garden over at the farm, even though I'm not selling vegetables anymore. I'm still out there, you know. So. Yeah, and um, do you have any uh, wisdom for other gardeners, uh, maybe who are novice or given all your years of experience? So, well, that's the key word right there. The wisdom is the, that experience is the best teacher. I mean, you can read all the books as, you know, thousands of great books and, you know, probably thousands of not so great books, but you could take a little bit from anything, you know, and apply it. Uh, but just get out there and do it. Certainly don't be afraid of trying or failure. Uh, you know, experience is the best teacher. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, thank you. So, um, oh, I also wanted to add that what I know about you in Plymouth, also in being out in your boat, you, you are surrounded by seals often, right? Uh, yeah, uh, we have a, a, a south facing uh, point and it used to be the seals would come down from Maine to overwinter uh, in a kind of sheltered setting, but now they're here pretty much year round and in fact, uh, not just harbor seals, but now we have the bigger gray seals that used to be more common to the Outer Cape. Uh, so uh, consequently, we have more sharks, uh, you know, with food source multiplying, the uh, predators come back. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen things with, uh, I haven't seen any, any uh, sharks up close and personal, but last year I saw uh, seals chasing uh, schools of herring and they were like humpback whales uh, surrounding the, the school of fish and just bursting up through the water fish flying everywhere seals going everywhere it was wow. pretty amazing I was out in my yeah. boat and very close to it wow well yeah. hopefully there will be some fish left for you also <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> and thank you um, so I look forward to sharing your story now with everyone thank you Frank Thank you, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. My name is Frank Albany. I live in Plymouth, Mass. I'm 67 years old. And before I start my Earth Day is Every Day story, I want to thank Cheryl and all of you for all the good work that you do trying to make this world a better place. My story starts when I was 42 years old back in 1995. I had been doing carpentry for most of my life and I decided I was going to try organic farming. 
So I rented five acres of land at the Seoul Homestead Education Center in Middleborough, Mass. And then my education began. And for the next 24 years, I grew and sold organic vegetables. Now about the time I started farming, I was also getting into Native American history and culture. And, you know, I think it's pretty widely accepted that Native Americans saw themselves as a part of nature, not separate from it. And they didn't look at the world as something to be cut up and exploited. Uh, most of you probably know of Chief Seattle's famous speech and the words that are most often quoted are man did not weave the web of life he is merely a strand in it what he does to the web he does to himself that speech was given in 1854 and unfortunately I don't think a lot of people have listened to what Chief Seattle said but anyway one day I was on the farm, uh, working away, maybe the first or second year I started farming, walking across the plow field, and I noticed a reflection. And I thought, well, there's a piece of glass over there. I better go pick it up. So I walked over, bent down to pick it up, and lo and behold, it was this beautiful arrowhead, quartz arrowhead glistening in the sun. I was thrilled when I found it. Uh, yeah. It was the first arrowhead I ever found, and uh, it was just amazing, beautiful. And, of course, when you find something like this, you start thinking, how did it get here? How old is it? You know, 500 years old, 1,000 years old? And I found it about 100 yards up from the little stream that runs through the farm, so it's a perfect wildlife habitat. It was some old native here, you know, in antiquity, hunting deer, and he lost this arrowhead. So I decided I would wear it as a necklace. And I put this uh, silver wire on it. I put a piece of rawhide uh, through the wire. And I wore it on my neck for several years. Well, a few years later, I'm working away out at the farm, running around, trying to get things done. And I notice it's gone. And uh, I was devastated because I had been all over acres of ground that day. But I decided I'd start looking. So I searched for hours. No luck. Well, about that time, I had just finished reading this book called A Mutant Message from Down Under by an American named Marlo Morgan. And she, the one thing I took away from the book, she talked about how the natives, the aborigines in Australia, they don't worry too much about the past or the future. What's important is how you feel right now. And as I remembered that thought, there it was right in front of me. My arrowhead was there in the grass. And uh, it was as if the universe was trying to impress upon me the importance of that. How do you feel right now? So I haven't forgot that to this day. And I'm always asking myself, how do I feel? You know, are we having fun yet type thing? And for me, the thing that makes me feel good, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, is love. And how love manifests itself in my life in one way is through the garden, through growing vegetables. And while I'm out there, I'm at peace. I thank the sun and the rain and the wind. I thank the bees and the flowers and the food. And I thank the soil. Because the soil is what gives us our daily bread. And thus, every day is Earth Day. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, there's a lot of different messages in that story, as well as the, um, the loss of your, uh, for your necklace piece there. And um, I appreciate that you shared the words of Chief Seattle um, and also the importance of gratitude for all that we have in the earth to uh, 
show us how to do that is so important because so often what we have all around us in the earth is taken for granted. And I would imagine working with the earth as an organic farmer that you see things close up that way and never take earth for granted. So thank you for all the wisdom of your story that you had to share. Thank you, Cheryl. And um, Frank's story, as well as um, references to some other uh, questions and chat that's come up, I'd like to ask audience to consider uh, what treasure have you did, have you found uh, at some point in your interactions outside in the natural world? I imagine that there are a lot of stories about that to consider. And I see we have a comment um, agreeing with Earth Day is every day uh, with Frank's good story. So good to hear from you uh, out there in audience. And again, thank you, Frank. So now we have a story coming from Newton, Massachusetts with Deborah Rocha. Hello, Deborah. Hello, Cheryl. There you are. Good to <laughs> see you. Nice to see everybody. Yes, Deborah, in your bio, um, you make reference to dealing with this time of pandemic and the quarantine um, that you just got your second vaccine shot. Right, and you're you're just recovering, right? Yes. Uh, from that yesterday, maybe not feeling as well, but today much better. Much better. Good to hear. And uh, in uh, talking about yourself a little, when I asked some questions, you said you're looking forward to holding your grandchildren in your lap for a Absolutely. few hours. Oh, so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm happy for you too, and getting closer to it with the vaccine. I'm glad you could be here today. Mm -hmm. So for people to also know about Deborah, um, that she grew up in the Midwest and she wanted to live as an adult, a uh, young adult in an underdeveloped part of the world to go back in time to things were simpler. And so she, has, she had lived in Brazil and lives in Newton now for 32 years and says, I really like my community. Deborah also, I added to her bio, is a beautiful quilting art artist. And um, uh, not um, stopping with making a beautiful quilt, but telling a story often in her quilts about people in life as well. And there's usually a lot of uh, nature references, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And Deborah is a gifted songwriter and musician and has two CDs. Two. Two CDs, that's right. And Deborah uh, once wrote a song about the environmental activist Wangari Mathai. Yes. Which uh, is a wonderful song. Thank you, sir. So, <laughs> yes, so. Um, and I'm so glad that you were able to contribute one of your stories. You know, I was thinking about you and when we used to meet sometimes in between for coffee and you would start to tell me a story from your life, not on purpose, but just because we were talking, having conversation. And just because you're a natural storyteller who <laughs> gives a lot of details, I would feel like I was traveling wherever you were with your stories. Awesome. Nice. whether they were near or far. Mm. And I know there was one time, probably the last time we were together out, you said something like you were with one of your young family members and you felt like it was important to perhaps uh, create a song about where food comes from, which is what Frank was just talking about. Yeah. And I thought, what a great idea, because again, we often take that for granted, right? And mm. this... Uh, time where we are living and I wonder if you ever made up the song or if you could if you have any thoughts related to that or whatever else you'd like to say for a couple of minutes well I haven't yet made up a song about that but um 
I might, I might, I may still be able to do that, Cheryl. I'm, you've, you've piqued my uh, memory of our conversation now, so I might Good. be able to do that. <laughs> yes, great. Maybe a third CD. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see. Yes, and uh, you, you have uh, a CD of beautiful uh, Brazilian-inspired music, um, mm. likely from living there for mm -hmm. a number of years and um, also of your original songs. And um, I uh, am wondering from the art that you make and uh, the places you lived, um, how that comes together for you now. Um, what are your thoughts about um, helping teach grandchildren, our, our future generations about the importance of the earth? from all you've experienced? Well, I always try to remind them um, where food comes from because they think it comes from the grocery store. Um, but we do, we go, we take them to, to farmer's markets and take them to farms um, just so that they can see exactly, you know, that food really does come from earth. Um, and we have a compost a composter in our backyard and we plant a, a garden, not a very big garden because we don't have a lot of space, but enough to, to give us greens over the summertime. And then we have um, lots of raspberries. And the raspberries, of course, are one of my teaching instruments for the grandchildren because who doesn't love to pick gra uh, raspberries fresh off the bushes? In the afternoon when they're warm from the sun, <gasps> it's heaven. Hmm. That sounds wonderful. That's how I try to help them understand where food comes from. Yeah, well, I think that uh, you are likely teaching important things about the world and the earth uh, a lot of the time that you are with them. Lucky grandchildren, they are. <laughs> so, <laughs> lucky um, grandma, I am. They're great Lucky kids. grandma, you are too, right? So... There's a little reference in your story about eating some interesting yes. things. Um, uh, so let's take <laughs> a look at this adventure you talk about. Thank you for being part of tonight. Thank you. Cheryl. Good evening, Thank everyone. You guys at H -Cam. My name is Deborah Rocha. Um, that last name, Rocha, is a Portuguese name. I'm married to a Brazilian and a couple of years ago, we were finally able to realize a dream we had long had, to visit the Amazon River. The mighty Amazon River begins at the confluence of the Rio Negro and the Rio Solimões. We needed to cross that confluence in order to get to our camp. The guides slowed the boat and asked us to put our hands in the water of the Rio Negro, a river of very cold water, made dark from the tannins of decaying matter. Just ahead of us was the dividing line between the rivers. And that line is quite clear because the Solimois is a light brown. As we entered the brown water, the temperature rose by at least 10 degrees. The waters of these two rivers do not mix until many miles downstream. As far as our eyes could see from the middle of that confluence, there were actually two rivers flowing side by side, one black, one light brown. Once across the big river, we traveled by canoe down a small tributary to the Amazon. On this first excursion, we saw what normal everyday life is like. We greeted families traveling and working along the river. In many respects, it was no different from strolling down our own street. Finally, we reached the camp. Situated on a high bank, we stepped out onto a floating dock that was attached to a stairway of some 25 steps. At the top of these, we turned to see the marvelous forest stretched out below us. Our hosts explained that during the six months of the rainy season, the forest at our feet was completely submerged, more of a lake than a river, and the floating dock would be tied up right next to where we were then standing. The following day, we were taken by our young guides into the forest. We simply walked off the end of the boardwalk that served the camp 
and in a few steps were so deep into the forest that the camp completely disappeared from view. In the Amazon rainforest, your field of vision is never more than 25 feet or so. You look up and you cannot fathom where the sun is in the sky. It's like you are engulfed in an ocean of green. Gradually, we began to see small gashes in trees that marked the pathway. We stopped at many of these where Juan would chip off a sliver of bark and give it to us to taste and smell while telling us what that tree is used for in traditional healing. We had quite a few unique experiences. Juan brought us to a palm tree in fruit. The fruit were, was small coconuts about the size of a date. He opened one up and found a grub, showed it to us, popped it into his mouth and gave us a big grin, as did his assistant. We were then offered one, a grub about that big, wiggly, fat, translucent. Well, I had to take the dare. And before that grub could move, popped it and chewed. It was like eating a piece of soft coconut pudding, rich and flavorful. Juan showed us a tree which had a large black growth surrounding the first fork of the tree. This was an ant colony built by the ants much the same way that wasps make their paper nests. Juan put his two hands upon the outside of the structure. Almost instantly, his arms were filled with minuscule ants and he rubbed them into his skin, explaining that the smell they produce is one of the most effective insect repellents that exists. We followed his example. And finally, Juan told us that there is a tree that travels through the forest. And a few steps away, he pointed out an odd palm tree that had a dozen or so aerial roots. He laughed at me, these are not roots, these are legs. These legs come together at a joint about two feet from the forest floor. As the palm produces new roots, these are light sensitive and they grow toward the sunlight, eventually rooting and pulling the plant in that direction. Juan showed us where some of the old roots have broken off to allow the palm to move forward at the rate of about half a meter per year. If you Google the image of walking palm plant, you will see pictures of this marvel. If you have ever had the desire to travel to the Amazon, I encourage you. It is like nowhere else on our beautiful earth. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I feel like I traveled the Amazon with you in that story. And I ate some new uh, interesting things. And I love the idea of a walking tree. And uh, I imagine that many people have uh, connections or stories related to trees. And I, I know that's a really special one that you have. So thank you so much for being here and bringing the Amazon with you today. And now I would like to introduce Madhuri Waje. Hello, Madhuri. Hi, Shiro. Yeah, hi, Shiro. Good to see you. Thank you for joining today. I have your information um, on um, right next to me on my device. So I'll just let folks know and then we can talk for a minute or two after. Just to let everyone know that Madhuri uh, is a financial professional living in Hopkinton for seven years, uh, born in India in a family of farmers. And Madhuri has always felt connected with mother nature, its beauty with the places that she visits. She also likes to spend time in nature, reading yoga and doing meditation. She's a core member volunteer of SEWA International, which helps with service projects around the community and is co-chair of the social committee of Hopkinton Women's Club. And so I know you keep very busy. You keep me posted on what is going on um, is the, as a volunteer for SUA, is it um, called as an acronym? Yeah, it's a SEWA actually. SEWA means service. Okay. 
And uh, I looked it up. It is a Hindu word defining selfless service or act dedicates itself to serving those in need, regardless of race, religion, gender, or other circumstances. And I know you've been really busy uh, as um, the intention is to provide disaster relief, public hygiene, family services, and child education. Um, and that the uh, organization has been busy in the Metro West area in Hopkinton as well. So I thank you for the uh, service that you have been doing. And when I talk to you, when I hear you, I always hear a deep connection and reverence to the natural world from you um, and in hearing about you on going on trails or even just being outside um, meeting in our front yard with masks on one day. And I wonder if you uh, can share where you think um, maybe you had some of the uh, influence of having such a deep connection with nature, how that got started for you if it was uh, a person in your life or uh, experience outside as a child? Um, as uh, I was born in India, in India, you know, like uh, the outside weather is like same like what you feel inside. So there's no like a lot of air conditioner and uh, heater and stuff like that. So always like if it's raining, we we used to get wet and all those things. So it's like more gelling in nature and get along with it. When I came here, I'm like <laughs> mostly in a closed apartment or in a house and I kind of started missing. And definitely it was taking a little toll on my health too. But um, after a while and uh, I, when I started more into yoga, meditation and more into spiritual journey, I should say, I felt more and more connected to the nature and the places I visit. So even if I'm walking down and suddenly I see the different trees and I suddenly stop and I feel like I'm talking to them. <laughs> it it feels a little messy, but yeah. And I was like wondering why, but I don't know as I resonate with all of other uh, storyteller here, how the mystery in nature and mother earth, they can feel and find and same thing is happening with me. So it's glad to be. Thank you. With the nature, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you so much. And I know you take us on a trip uh, in your story as well. So I look forward to sharing this story with everyone. So thank you for your, your contribution of story this evening and being here. Thank you. I remember being to Alaska in summer of 2019, just before the pandemic happened. And I couldn't believe um, it just happened actually. My daughter just said, let's go to Alaska this summer and she, I just told her, okay, can you can you plan the trip and let's see how it goes. And she literally planned out every day what to do. And I just gave her budget, then we sit and just booked everything. And within eight days, we landed in Alaska. I was so mesmerized to see the beauty. Next day we went to daytime cruise, I was so amused to see and just to drive by the big mountains next to oceans, ocean and just driving by. I was like, wow, this is something amazing. I just, then we just on a cruise, we could see all the Reels dancing, seagulls, orcas, and penguins. And the best part is the iceberg. When we saw the iceberg, hmm, I couldn't take my eyes from it. I never saw that best color, blue color of eyes. I never imagined that eyes can hold the color and the magic. 
next day we were driving, we went to Fairbank. We drove around 1500 miles in just five days. And that's pretty amazing, but that's the best part. The road trip, the driving, we were just stopping. Like I was, oh, wait, wait, wait. Whenever there's a beautiful mountains and clouds coming down, and I couldn't take off my eyes and I have to stop and see those. I could feel the magic. I have never seen something like that. We were literally stuck and like, I was feeling like I'm driving in heaven. And what is the, what is other best place than earth? This mother earth gives so much, so much. We have to just feel it and connect to it. We are part of it. We definitely can feel it. I was so thankful that we came here. And the local people, when I talked to, they just said, oh, they happen to be tourists like us. And they just love the place and they stayed there forever. And they are like, they have families and everyone there. And I said, wow, I really want to come back. Only if I can take that winter. <laughs> but definitely for summer, I can, I can always, uh, I, I can always visit and stay there. So I was like crazy. In Fairbanks, we went to the resort where it, they, they had a natural hot spring. People say they can see northern lights, northern lights uh, from there, but that day wasn't that uh, best for the lights. But definitely the healing power of that hot spring was something amazing. The museum we went, they were saying, there are every few minutes, there is some earthquake in Alaska and I was, hmm. I, we couldn't feel it, but when seeing data, we are like, okay, yeah. But I mean, uh, it's just crazy to know that every few minutes there is some earth shaking <laughs> under you, and and still you don't feel it, and you are just normal, and you are tourist, and you are enjoying the place. The last thing we did is going to Denali National Park. It was raining and a uh, little cold, but we managed to just do some part of the day and just drive by and go for a small hike. And what a beautiful place. We saw, we saw moose roaming around and so much it has offered. I definitely want to go back and again, feel that magic. I can feel that magic. And uh, not just in Alaska, I can, I feel that magic everywhere, everywhere, wherever I go in nature, this mother earth has given us so much that I cannot say thank you enough. Thank you, Matt Hurry. I want to thank you for that trip to Alaska. I have never been, but I have heard about the beauty and seen uh, the pictures and you really do help us travel there and see this amazing part of the earth. So thank you so much for your story today. Thank you. And, um, Perhaps there is a place to consider for um, your own story um, that feels like magic that you have been to, whether it's down the street uh, for you as audience viewers or it's um, across the world. I don't know, but I imagine that invites a lot of possible um, memories and experiences that people might have to share and talk about might even be a good uh, topic itself for inviting stories. And um, 
So I know uh, we did hear in chat from Lori. Uh, thank you uh, in responding to um, some of the past stories also. And uh, Lori uh, thinks about her, how she used to make terrariums with a lot of moss uh, back in her day. Um, so it's good to hear how we interact with elements of the earth um, for hobbies as well as for travel as Madhuri had shared. Thank you. Now we're going to travel over to Vermont to Alan Holmans. Hi, Alan. Hi, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Alan, I noticed on your email tonight, you have a expression at the bottom, be safe, be well, be kind, wear a mask. And uh, that sounds like I was, I, I thought, oh, that's a cheery and helpful message. And um, for those who don't know you, uh, Alan, lives in Huntington, Vermont for 30 years now. And he says that he likes to do anything with his hands, cooking, gardening, woodworking, with lots to do in the old house that he lives in. Um, and Alan used to be an avid, but not a good runner, he writes, but with a new titanium knee, I'm working on a new identity. <laughs> so a non-runner maybe. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad for your new knee, though. And Alan says he likes messing around the woods. I know him to be a pretty serious hiker um, out in the woods. And he and his wife have two daughters who he said, I am happy to say, share our love of the outdoors. Alan also is a doctor uh, in pediatrics and in oncology. And he also adds that his undergraduate major, however, was in animal behavior, which still fascinates him. So, and uh, you did note also that it shows up in your story, this fascination. So it still stays with you. And um, well, I think we're gonna learn about some different things from your story. Um, but you had mentioned something in a previous email about sit spots. Um, you had told me about, do you, do you remember uh, what that was in reference to? Well, I, I first heard the term from a podcast that my brother-in-law in Cincinnati has called Nature Guys. And sit spots actually is a, um, I think it's interesting because it's something we all do, but like so many things, we have to give it uh, an official name and designation these days. Yeah. Uh, it refers to just going out and finding a place and sitting down for 15 minutes and being awestruck by your surroundings, which comes out in so many of the stories we've heard tonight. Um, so right. I yeah. frequently would go out in our woods with a small thermos of tea and, and be awestruck. Um, now I know it has a name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll help you spread the word also. You and Nature Guys, that's the name of the podcast, right? Yes. So that would be something else we can hear more stories and say hello to them podcast wise. And, um, you know, Ellen, since you are a doctor anyway, hiking is pretty important to you. And any uh, little tidbit you'd like to add of why it's important to get out in nature? Well, uh, um, you know, I, I'm struck as the years go by, I'm going to retire soon. Hopefully, I'll be able to spend even more time outdoors. That I see these parallels between forest ecology and medicine. Um, they're both really about balance and harmony and adaptation. Um, and tonight's story is a little bit about adaptation as well. Um, I was thinking of um, Frank when he was talking about the garden and just getting out and trying things that my garden is very much a uh, exercise in adaptation and Darwinism. Um, I put <laughs> lots of things out there and only the strong survive. <laughs> well, uh, I imagine that you're getting some good harvest, though, uh, with your trial and error, uh, as I remember from past meals going on. There. So, we try. Yes. Well, thank you. That's that's good. Uh, that is really interesting to hear you pull that in also of science and medicine and the importance of uh, the, uh, the impact of our environment as well on our health and well-being. So uh, we'll learn a little more in, in your story. And thank you for contributing 
your story today about nature as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alan Homans, um, and my wife and I have been friends with Cheryl and John for many, many years. Um, this story actually goes back 60 years to when I was a kid. And if we were camping, sometimes my father would tell my sister and brother and I um, stories uh, that featured three little woodland creatures. Um, one was a raccoon, one was a skunk, I think, and one was an amphibian. Um, and these guys would go on adventures in the woods that would feature a magic bridge. The bridge was magic because you could only cross it one way. And then these guys would have adventures and eventually my dad would get tired and something amazing would happen and it, they would end up back home. Well, fast forward 30 years, um, my wife and I were fortunate enough to have two little girls and I wanted to carry this tradition forward. So I would start telling them stories. Um, my stories evolved a little bit from my father's. Somewhere along the line, a bear named Jack joined them and the girls quickly called them Jack the Bear stories. And the bridge had acquired some somewhat telepathic powers. So whatever you were thinking about before you crossed the bridge would influence where you ended up on the other side. So if it was a hot day, you thought you wanted to be cool, you might end up in the Arctic. Um, but you still could only go across the bridge one way, and these guys would have adventures, and um, eventually something miraculous would happen, frequently involving fairies or elves or a magic cave or something, and they'd all end up back home. When they ended up across the bridge, um, they usually ended up meeting an animal that Jack knew, and the animal would tell the girls about how it lived and how it was adapted and what it ate for food and what it did for shelter, et cetera, et cetera. When I was telling the girls these stories, I became struck by just how much time and energy animals in Northern climates put into coping with winter. Um, they spend time looking for food, storing food either externally or storing food in the form of fat. Um, changing their metabolism. So either they truly hibernate or they go into a deep sleep, but a huge amount of effort goes into dealing with winter. So I was reflecting on this a few weeks ago when I was snowshoeing in the woods. Um, we had a really good snow pack this year, uh, a couple of feet maybe of powdery fluffy stuff without a January thaw. I was shuffling along paying not much attention when I was startled by two little explosions in the snow about 20 feet from me. I saw a puff of snow, a flash of brown that I didn't really see what it was, and then it was all over. Um, all I could think of was, and I, I hate to use a military metaphor, but seeing videos in the 60s of ICBMs shooting out of the ground with a puff of smoke from somewhere in the Midwest. So I shuffled over there and sure enough, there were holes in the snow, maybe five or six inches across, going down maybe a foot, foot and a half. And leading up to these holes for five or six feet were a tunnel, one tunnel for each hole. Um, tunnels were maybe eight or 10 inches deep. Um, the roof was collapsed on top um, and it led into the hole. Um, I had no idea what this was. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, I knew we had ruffled grouse up in the woods, but I didn't even know if they were there in the winter, let alone whether this could be them. I went home and looked it up, and sure enough, um, when the conditions are right and when you have deep, um, fluffy snow, grouse will deal with the cold temperatures by building snow caves. So they burrow into the snow, they tunnel under the surface for a while, build themselves a little snow cave and stay there um, insulated by the snow from the more bitter cold air on the outside. Um, when some, you know, person like me comes along or they're disturbed, then they burst out of their snow cave and shoot up into the air. So those were the wing prints I could see around the outside of the tunnel. And I was just awestruck, uh, you know, a word that is uh, overused these days, that these birds could do this. I mean, this has to be encoded in their DNA. They don't live that long, you know, five or six years as a long-lived grouse in this climate, and that they could have this behavior sort of in waiting in their genetic code for the right conditions, the right temperatures, the right everything. And it just 
I, you know, I'm never, um, I, I'm constantly just awestruck over and over again by the adaptations that occur in the wild around us. Um, that's my story. I, I hope you found it interesting. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh, I feel like I just heard a story told to me uh, like a Jack the Bear story uh, with your wonderful adventure in the snow with the grouse. Um, so, and the, the experience of being awestruck uh, is important to be sharing with one another. So thank you so much for your beautiful story. And now I'd like to invite Amy Meverack to join me. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Amy. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I um, will share a little bit about you and look forward to everyone hearing your story, which I enjoyed, which takes place actually in Vermont, where Alan's from. And um, Amy Meverack has studied herbal medicine with Rosemary Gladstar and Sage Maurer. And currently, uh, Amy's at Lesley University in a Master's of Fine Arts program in creative writing, right? Right, yeah, and nonfiction. And nonfiction, okay. And I also know about Amy that she is a talented poet and playwright and author. And there's probably a book or two on the way. Uh, in progress, in yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> working on it with all the, your studies and all going on. Um, and Amy also plays the piano and uh, Celtic fiddle and likes to sing karaoke with your four daughters. Um, so that, uh, that sounds like a lot of fun, especially this past year. Are you singing a lot at home these days? Um, when the girls are in the mood, they like Taylor Swift karaoke. Oh, okay. But, but they let me sing Queen because I don't know the lyrics to Taylor Swift. <laughs> well, variety is good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, I imagine, is really fun. <laughs> it's <laughs> fun for me. They think it's wacky, <laughs> which it's it is. Wacky. But yeah, I love that. So the other thing about you is that you recently released a video of your poem titled Eight as in the number eight, uh, which is available on YouTube. And that is a stunning video of your poem and you outside uh, and somebody really talented working with you on the cinematography of that. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, I noticed you put me eighth on the, on the roster too. Ah. <laughs> exciting um yeah it was it was a, a time when we were all staying inside so much um and to go out there to western massachusetts and spend six hours filming this out in the forest there was a waterfall i was on a rope descending down into a gorge and i stood on a rock with my holding out my dress um out of the puddle and and I was barefoot because I was wearing heels and then I had to just take them off because that was not safe. Um, but it was just a beautiful experience where it felt like the light and the trees and everything was was with us. And we were all doing this, this one project together. It was like a dance where all the elements were, were harmonized. Um, so that it was just a really amazing experience. Um, and then the... Um, the, the the putting it together that was that was Roger Ingraham um, pulling all these images together that um, that made it really way more than I could do on my own and I think that's also the the theme of my story today is that when we work together we can accomplish more way more than than we can alone and so I'm really you know excited to be in this group this if you're if you're watching on YouTube there's there's you may not know that there's a, a gallery of storytellers backstage, which is really exciting. I'm just impressed with the, the technical wizardry that's gone into putting this together. And I'm very grateful to be part of it. Yeah, well, I'm grateful that you're here this evening and I look forward to sharing your story with the audience now as I loved it and look forward to having everybody else here. So thank you so much, Amy. Okay, thank you. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Miverek. Thank you, Cheryl, for gathering us here. And thank you to all of you who are listening. My story takes place in Danby, Vermont, where I went for a workshop in July 2019 with the wonderful herbalist Pam Montgomery. The subject of the workshop was recognizing our connection with nature, that we don't need to reconnect because we have never been separate. And one of the exercises that she asked us to do that weekend was as we're sitting around on the grass, about 15 of us, she asked us each to choose an element of nature and to spend about 10 minutes communing with that element. So we could choose water from the stream that was, was passing by us that was so pure we could drink out of it. We could choose trees or clouds or animals. And I chose the wind. So we went off in our separate directions. I walked over to the edge of a field where the mown grass ended and there were wildflowers growing and tall grasses and butterflies. And I felt the wind on my arms and I felt the wind on my face. And it was a, it was a light, gentle, warm breeze. And I looked at the field and I saw the grasses swaying in the wind and I saw a butterfly land on a flower and then swing up and do this extraordinary dance with the wind. And it was so much a part of the wind. They were so connected that I thought, you know, if I climb this tree behind me, then I will be higher into the air and I will be more connected with the wind and I will have a deeper experience of this, this exercise. And so I reached up, I climbed up to this sturdy branch that was not too far above my head and hoisted myself onto that and then climbed up a little further and then a little further. And then above my head, I saw this nook that would be the perfect spot to sit and connect with the wind. And so I climbed up to this nook. And when I, when I got there, I got a little comfortable spot, as comfortable as you can get in a tree. I looked around and I was surrounded by leaves and I didn't feel the wind at all. I felt spider webs and I felt sticky things and I felt my heart pounding and a little bit of panic that I wouldn't be able to get down from this tree. And then I thought that that's not the point of the exercise. We were not meant to feel anxiety. We were supposed to feel calm and rooted and connected with the earth. And so I really don't have anything to prove. I better just get myself out of this tree. And so I started to climb down. I got to that branch, that sturdy branch that didn't seem so far above my head when I went up, but now it seemed pretty, pretty high off the ground. And I kicked the tree a little bit to find a foothold, but I didn't find a foothold. So I wasn't sure what to do. And I looked off at the edge of the field and I saw a woman walking very contemplatively, connecting with something deeply. And I thought, well, I could just call her over, ask her, you know, can you please grab my waist, help me to the ground? And that'll be the safest way to get down. But I really didn't want to disturb her meditative walk. So I let her pass by and walk into the woods and I let go. One foot hit the grass, another foot hit a rock that jammed my toes up in the air and I fell to the ground and I thought, okay, I'm fine. Mainly because nobody saw it. So I stood up and I started to walk and I realized, no, I'm not fine. I actually can't walk without immense pain. So the lesson I learned from this is that instead of asking one person for help with one thing, I spent the rest of the weekend asking everybody for help with everything. And people would bring me food, clear my dishes. Two men carried me up the hill to the bonfire so we could get eaten alive by mosquitoes so loud. They sounded like a motorcycle race. And a woman gave me ski poles out of the back of her car so I could hobble around when I wasn't getting carried by the guys. And um, people gave me ice packs and herbal medicine. And the lesson I learned was that we are all connected and it is okay to ask for help.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, uh, for sharing your adventure in Vermont and with the tree and the lessons learned there too. We have two more stories at this time. Um, and I next want to invite Polly Brown, uh, my friend from town down the street. Hello, Polly, good to see you. Hi, Cheryl. I will tell you a little bit about Polly and then we'll talk for a couple minutes. Uh, Polly that you see there is married to Alex Brown, who is a scientist and an activist who raises awareness for climate change. And you both, you have been married for over 50 years at this point, yes. And in the first years of marriage in the 70s, uh, Polly and Alex built and lived in a yurt for a few years with your first baby, right? Um, and Polly also acknowledges Mostly, I am a poet. Poems and walking are both very low budget ways of stumbling into astonishment. <laughs> and so Polly has uh, stumbled her way into three published books of beautiful poetry uh, that are generally uh, inspired, if not all, by nature. And her last book of poetry is stunning, I'll add. So Polly is in Hopkinton and has given, she and Alex have given themselves an award for a merit badges and as intrepid ancient explorers, having <laughs> walked almost every single marked path in the state park and probably beyond as well. I know you could see two figures even in the dark on the sidewalks at Hopkinton streets or uh, <laughs> toward the woods. And that would be Polly and Alex in town. And Polly also ha worked as a teacher at Touchstone School in Grafton. And um, there was work outdoors and Polly notes that she and her students were involved in making a set of videos about watersheds called Voyage to the Sea that people can also see on YouTube. So I hope folks are taking notes tonight on these YouTube uh, channels and programs. And Polly, I just want to ask you, was, oh, voyage to the sea. Good, good. Okay. <laughs> Anything else that uh, you left out of your story that you'd like to talk about in a couple of minutes before we see your story? Well, f five minutes is short. It's like really short. Your story. Yeah, but that was good. That was good. But I wound up thanking a, a number of people sort of by category, um, by group. And, and, and I, I just want to say that in, in, my, in my heart, the, those are very specific people, um, some of whom, some of whom are, are watching and listening. So, okay. and one of whom is you. So <laughs> thank you <laughs> in the experience that the story is about. Um, Amy's, Amy's point was, was inescapable the need for other people became very, very real. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. So are you ready to show your story? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let's take a look. This story involves Alex Brown and Touchstone Community School and the Merrimack River and Lowell General Hospital. I've been married to Alex Brown for a little more than 50 years, and we've been connected to Touchdown Community School one way or another for a good chunk of that. Touchdown is in Grafton in the Blackstone River watershed, which means that rain and snow melt coming down Touchstone's hillside will eventually wind up in the Blackstone River by way of Misko Brook and the West River, joining the water from other brooks and rivers drop by drop, all of this powered by gravity, and eventually ending up in Narragansett Bay and the North Atlantic. There is vulnerability in all this gathering. 
it means that uh, that things like pollution can concentrate in a bad way. But there is also power in the way that the, the habitats all over the watershed are connected by the rivers and the brooks. And there is power in the way that human communities have come together to focus on their watersheds, their shared watershed territory, and to heal and restore those watersheds. Did I know any of this when my life at Touchstone began? No. I explored watersheds and other, other place-based, big picture ways of understanding the world with my students, with other teachers, fellow teachers, with parent volunteers, with park rangers, with a lot of field trips. And Alex Brown came on those field trips whenever he could. After I retired, Alex was working at UMass Lowell and that wonderful learning energy was still in our hearts. And we would walk next to the Merrimack River, which flows right through the city of Lowell. And, and we would think about all the trickles and brooks and rivers contributing their, their water, um, their life to the Merrimack. And that included our own Massachusetts hillside here in Hockington. One morning, I got a phone call to say that Alex had collapsed at work and his heart had been restarted with a defibrillator and he'd been taken to Lowell General Hospital. And that night, as I, as I sat next to his bed in the ICU, um, trying to send my love into his coma. I thought about the river. I thought about the river just downhill, just right downhill from the hospital. And I reached out to the strength of the river and pulled it up through the rock and through the building and through my body and through my arm and through my hand into him. And that, that steadied me, not just that night, but for the next month and a half. And now, it's just every day, I thank the doctors and nurses and helpers of all kinds. I thank friends and family, huge kindness. I thank the people from Touchstone and UMass Lowell and Hopkinton who helped us. And I thank the power of the river and everything that means in my heart for saving him and saving us. Thank you so much, Polly, for that very powerful story. And I imagine that it has impact for others uh, as we were talking about how uh, the earth can feel connected to us, our bodies and our minds. And you give that evidence with your story. So thank you again. Thank you, Cheryl. And I know I had read in your notes also to credit once again for Voyage to the Sea, the kids, all these one wholehearted young environmentalists did wonderful work. So people can take a look at Voyage to the Sea. Thank you. And our last story for this evening um, is with Veer Sikand. And as I explained, Veer as a storyteller uh, is coming from Kenya, so cannot be here in person. But I have an introduction um, to share with you that has been videotaped um, that by his cousin. So 
His cousin is Viraj, who is uh, my daughter's partner. And Viraj offered to take my place in interviewing and to ask to introduce himself, uh, Veer, and his grandfather, Virendra, as well. So to give you a little background before this last film rolls, and then it will just roll on its own without questions uh, from me, the Sikan family are an environmentalist family in Kenya, and there are three generations uh, in the telling of this story, uh, but Veer will tell it himself. And there is Varendra, who is the oldest, 94 years old, and the grandfather to the family. And Varendra has helped to instill a culture of environmentalism into the family. And his late wife, Pamela, worked closely with Wangari Mafai and the reforestation project we've been making reference to tonight. Also in this video, the interviewer is Viraj, who is 27 years old, and he is starting an environmental company to deal with biodiversity, regeneration, and decarbonization. And he's going to Harvard to further explore how to use technology to accelerate this. And Veer, who is the storyteller, is the youngest member of this group, 12 years old, and an avid wildlife photographer and videographer. And he has his own YouTube channel that you can subscribe to. And I have, and I am a fan. So we will be hearing the story from him. And you can hear more stories after by looking up his name on the internet, Veer, V-E-E-R, Sikand, S-I-K-A-N-D. So let's take a listen to uh, the introduction and to the story which I believe involves some wildlife in Kenya. Okay, so uh, thank you first and foremost to Cheryl Perrault for this opportunity to um, participate in these Earth Day festivities, I suppose as part of HCAM's global community. We're, we're pre-recording this from Nairobi, Kenya. And um, yeah, so, you know, my name is Viraj Singh Sikan, and on my right is Veer Singh Sikhan. Yep, my, my 12 year old cousin. And on my left is Virinder Singh Sikhan. Yep, my uh, 94 year old grandfather. And so here we are, three generations, the oldest and the youngest of this, of this family. And so I want to start off with you, sir. So uh, Veer over here for the, for the audience, he, you know, he is probably one of the most passionate, if not the most passionate person I have met when it comes to wildlife. Ever since he's been a little boy, all of his time he's spent, whenever he has a free moment, he'll go out to national parks, taking photographs, meeting people. And he's since created this YouTube channel that's now getting viewers from as far as Turkey to America. And so, Veer, where did this passion come from and, and why did you create this YouTube channel? I created this YouTube channel to share awareness of conservation efforts and I also want to inspire other children around the world to go outside and meet like lo conservation heroes that are in that region and I was also want to share my photography, videography and I think that it came from that generation over there. From this generation? All right okay well Papa you're in the hot seat <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah tell us so uh, you know you, you both your sons environmentalists right your three grandchildren, they're all in environmental pr professions. All the people have come into the family, all the in-laws also. Because when I was Veer's age, yeah. I was also environment. We know we used to go for long walks mm. in the open air. Mm. And then while I was um, working as a lawyer, mm. our court finishes 10 o'clock mm. and I will sneak to the national park mm. and stay up there watching the animals and the trees up to 10 o'clock, no, up to uh, lunch time. Wow. Uh, wow. And then come and have lunch as if I am coming from the court. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess it all it all stems from our uh, our papa and and also our matriarch, uh, our you know papa's papa's uh, wife, my grandmother was also the vice chair to um, you know a Nobel Prize winning environmentalist, one guy Mathai. So uh, probably starts starts from there. Yeah. Um, and hopefully for many, many more. Um, so I think enough of this Q&A. 
time for Veer to lead us through a story of one of his, um, of uh, you know, one of his nature stories. So over to you, sir. Cut. Thank you, Viraj, and now let me tell you one of my most captivating stories yet. Hopefully there'll be very many more because these are so fun. It was in the Opachete Conservancy located in central Kenya on the foothills of Mount Kenya. And we were driving down a valley when we saw a distressed black rhino, but it was stumbling, which, was, which wasn't very normal. And so I called James Mwenda, the head ranger of the Northern White Rhinos, to inform him because I felt like we needed to because that it was, something was wrong. Once we had called him, he called the rangers in the area to come and assess who this rhino was and if it was okay. And once the rangers came, they said it was Thea, a three-year-old blind rhino who it seems was abandoned by her mother Perini the day before. And Perini might have gone to give birth or mate and Thea may have been a threat or in very big danger. I was very nervous because then I had to leave and there were some lions very close so that made me really, really scared. Once that was done, we went home and we got a call from James Munda a couple of hours later saying that they were going to translocate Thea. And that made me really, really excited because Thea was going to have a new home which was actually going to suit her needs. And so James invited me to go ahead and video all of the process. And I was so down for it any day, any year, any time because it's such a rare opportunity and I was managed and I managed to do it. So once that was done, we headed to the translocation site where we met Dr. Mijele, Dr. Ngulu, James himself and the rest of the team. And the vets were preparing the darts when I went into the when I went into the ranger car so that I could video the whole thing from up close and personal. And once we were in the ranger car it was time to go and the and the vets went in their little mini car to try and dart there. So Thea wasn't really cooperative and was taking her time and didn't want to get darted. But eventually we managed to blockade her and move her up towards the top of the valley where we where we managed to dart her and get her into the translocation truck. And we moved a couple of miles away to the endangered species enclosure a few kilometers away. And once we made it there, we released her into her new home and she looked so much happier there. So a couple of weeks later, James Mwenda invited me for another amazing opportunity in yet again Opajeta, where I got to work, walk with the last two Northern White Rhinos on the planet. Wow, it was such an amazing experience. Thank you so much, Opajeta and James Mwenda. Thank you so much, Veer and Viraj and Virendra as well over in Kenya and uh, the wonderful story that you have provided and remember that there is a YouTube channel for Veer to check out as well and hear more stories about the wildlife and the earth from his perspective. A wonderful storyteller, might I add, and also Viraj, I'd like to hire you to do the interviewing for me from now on too. It was wonderful to hear from all of you. It is time for us to end. I apologize, we went over time, Jim Cousins wins. Um, and I just wanna say it was really abundant also with all of you who came in to talk about Earth Day as is every day with the stories that you recorded, all the time that you put into making the stories, sharing them and being here tonight to share them together and to listen and connect with one another and with all of those watching as well. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful to all of you who are watching as audience. I'm grateful to HCAM TV crew. I'm grateful to all of you beautiful storytellers who help us feel more connected to the earth. I'm grateful to the planet and to Mother Earth as well. Next month on the first Friday of May, we have the theme of laughter is the best medicine. So um, you could uh, send me email at um, wake up, which is one word, at hcam.tv. If you have any thoughts or you'd like to share a story um, or you have an idea for another theme, I look forward to it. I love these programs. Uh, and uh, with the adventure of running them on Zoom and being live stream and not knowing uh, 
how it all works out, but it always works out perfect in my opinion. I thank you all for being a part of it tonight. Thank you again. Good night. Thank you.